In our headlines on this Wednesday afternoon, October 18th, here in South Korea. Officials in Gaza say some 500 people have lost their lives amid a hospital bombing that has sparked a fierce blame game as U.S. President Joe Biden makes his way to the Middle East in hopes of containing a broader regional confrontation. Meanwhile, the Biden administration has announced additional action to curb China's access to advanced computer chips as well as the equipment to make them about a year after first sharing such export controls to counter Beijing's chip expansion. And here on the local front, South Korea's auto exports for the first nine months of this year hit a fresh high for that particular period as global demand for eco-friendly cars keep the domestic auto industry revved up. Hundreds are believed to have been killed by a rocket that struck a hospital compound in the center of Gaza City. And while emergency workers frantically seek to respond to this latest disaster, the foes are engaged in a fierce battle of the blame game. Our Ishihu reports. A massive blast struck Al Alia Rabi Baptist Hospital in the center of Gaza City on Tuesday, local time. A Palestinian health ministry official said at least 500 people were killed in the blast. Hamas said that an Israeli airstrike hit the hospital, while the Israeli defense forces said that misfired rockets by Palestinian Islamic Jihad militants were to blame. The group has denied the accusation. Hundreds of patients and civilians were reportedly seeking shelter at the hospital. Survivors of the strike were transferred to another hospital 1.5 kilometers away. The World Health Organization condemned the attack. WHO strongly condemns the attacks on uh, the attack on an Ahli Arab hospital in the north of, Gaza, of the Gaza Strip. The hospital was operational with patients, healthcare givers, and internally displaced people sheltering there. The UN agency chief Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus on social media also called for the immediate protection of civilians and health care. The United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East also said at least six people have been killed in an Israeli airstrike that hit a school in Gaza run by the agency. Reuters, meanwhile, reported that an Israeli airstrike killed the Hamas armed commander Ayman Nofal in charge of the central Gaza area. Ishihu, Arirang News. And in related news, U.S. President Joe Biden is on his way to Israel to share support for his ally against Hamas and to seek the safety of ordinary Palestinians as well as Israelis facing the brunt of the brutal cross border violence. Our Igawan covers his upcoming agenda. U.S. President Joe Biden is heading to Israel on Wednesday. That is according to U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken following his more than seven-hour-long meeting in Tel Aviv with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his war cabinet. He's coming here at a critical moment for Israel, for the region, and for the world. And he's coming here to do the following. First, the president will reaffirm the United States' solidarity with Israel and our ironclad commitment to its security. Biden's visit comes as fears are growing that the latest flare-up in the Israel-Hamas war could spill into other countries in the region. Tensions have been escalating in the Middle East, with Israel exchanging fire with Iran-backed Lebanese militant group Hezbollah near its northern border with Lebanon. Iran has issued warnings against Israel's operations in Gaza. Leaders of the resistance will not allow the Zionist regime to do whatever it wants in Gaza and then go after other resistance groups after it's done with Gaza. Therefore, any preemptive action is possible in the coming hours. With world leaders such as UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan expressing the importance of avoiding further regional escalation, experts predict President Biden will also use his visit to avert the war's expansion. Addressing the dire humanitarian situation in Gaza is also on Biden's agenda, where civilians are facing severe shortages of water, electricity and fuel. The president will hear from Israel how it will conduct its operations in a way that minimizes civilian casualties and enables humanitarian assistance to flow to civilians in Gaza in a way that does not benefit Hamas. Biden will also continue his efforts to secure the release of at least 199 hostages held by Hamas. 
The militant group on Monday released a video showing a 21-year-old Israeli hostage who appeared to be suffering from an arm injury. This marks the first time that Hamas has made public a video of a hostage held in Gaza. Lee Young Eun, Arirang News. Meanwhile, military authorities here are drawing disturbing parallels between assault strategies currently being used by Hamas and those linked to North Korea. They've also confirmed the presence of North Korean weapons in the conflict region. Our defense correspondent Choi Min Jung reports. South Korea's military authorities have reason to believe that the weapons and tactics used by the Palestinian militant group Hamas are linked to North Korea. Speaking to reporters on Tuesday, an official from the Joint Chiefs of Staff noted that Hamas has been spotted using a North Korean-produced F-7 rocket. South Korea's military officials said that the F-7 is the name North Korea uses when exporting its RPG-7 rockets overseas. On top of that, North Korea's 122mm multiple rocket launchers have recently been discovered near Israel. The military is also weighing the possibility that North Korea passed on its paragliding tactics to Hamas. Around 260 people lost their lives when Hamas militants paraglided down into a music festival in Israel. And a similar tactic was used by North Korea in 2016 when the regime's special forces demonstrated a surprise attack on a model blue house. The JCS also pointed out that Hamas's tactics involving mass rocket attacks and early morning attacks during a holiday are similar to what it would assess North Korea's tactics would be. This being said, the military says there is a high chance that North Korea would use these tactics to attack South Korea. Our military is analyzing and evaluating the weapons and tactics used by Hamas. In addition, we are closely monitoring signs from North Korea using joint Seoul-Washington surveillance and reconnaissance assets. Our military maintains a thorough readiness posture against North Korean provocations. The JCS also assesses that Israel's Iron Dome defense system was effective to some extent given that 700 out of the 900 rockets fired toward the target area by Hamas were shot down. Choi min Arirang News. Sources say air forces of South Korea, Japan and the U.S. may host their first ever joint drill in skies over the peninsula this weekend. Now, while Seoul's defense ministry has yet to confirm the event, military sources on Wednesday claimed the drill will likely involve the U.S. B-52 strategic bomber, which is currently here in South Korea, escorted by fighter jets from the three nations. Previously, the ministry had spoken of efforts by Seoul, Tokyo and Washington to expand trilateral training to strengthen security against threats by North Korea, as agreed during the Camp David summit. In other news, Seoul's foreign ministry has shared disappointment over visits to and offerings at the controversial Yasukuni shrine by Japanese politicians. The minister has called on leaders in neighboring Japan to fully acknowledge and show sincere remorse for its past actions to better advance bilateral ties. Japanese media outlets say some 80 Japanese lawmakers from across the aisle paid their respects at the shrine on Wednesday following Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's ritual offerings sent the day prior. The shrine located in Tokyo honors Japan's war dead, including 14 Class A war criminals. President Yoon Seok-yeol has highlighted the importance of public safety, condemning crimes targeting the vulnerable, ranging from child abuse to domestic violence to sexual assault. Now, remarks to this end were shared at a ceremony on this Wednesday to mark the 78th anniversary of the founding of Korea's police agency, which falls on October 21st, that is, this coming Saturday. The president also pledged support to bolster policing capabilities via the broader distribution of new equipment such as knife-proof body armor and low-risk handguns. The top office says 31 delegates from foreign police entities were at this morning's event to mark Korea's National Police Day. On the trade front, despite the overall downturn on Korea's export front, its overseas auto shipments have seen a remarkable performance this year on the back of global demand for eco-friendly vehicles. Our Park has numbers to prove it. 
South Korea's auto exports hit new highs in the January to September period this year, reaching 52.1 billion U.S. dollars on the back of record high eco-friendly car exports to North America and the EU. According to the industry ministry on Wednesday, in the first nine months of 2023, some $18 billion worth of green automobiles were exported, exceeding the total for 2022, which amounted to $16.1 billion. And with total car exports rising on-year for 15 consecutive months in September, an industry ministry official said an even brighter future for outbound shipments is expected. And with this year's figure from January to September surpassing the $38.4 billion recorded for the same period in 2022, the official added, the total value of exports for 2023 is also likely to pass last year's total of $54.1 billion. Production in September dipped slightly on year due to partial strikes within the industry, but has hovered above 300,000 units for 13 consecutive months. The industry ministry expects production to hit at least 400,000 vehicles by the end of 2023 if the trend continues, a figure not seen since 2018. On the domestic front, sales of new cars decreased 4.7 percent on year in September. Sales of eco-friendly cars increased around 2 percent from the year before. However, EV sales dropped 34 percent in September something the environment ministry said was due to an announcement on expanded subsidies which was set for the 25th of that month. Park Geun-hye, Arirang News. The Biden administration is ramping up its restrictions on China's access to advanced computer chips as well as the equipment to make them. The additional actions come about a year after such export limitations were first launched to counter China's chip expansion. Our Lee Sing jae reports. The U.S. Department of Commerce on Tuesday announced a set of rules to update and strengthen its restrictions on the export of advanced computing semiconductors to China. The Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security released an update to rules for strengthening export controls after guidelines were published a year ago to restrict China from purchasing and manufacturing high-end chips deemed critical for military advantage. Among the updated rules are notification requirements for the export of certain chips with performance just below the restricted threshold. It also includes new rules to prevent companies from China and other countries of concern from securing controlled chips through their foreign subsidiaries. According to Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, the updates on the measures are set up to increase the effectiveness of U.S. controls and further shut off pathways to evade restrictions. She added that the controls remain Washington's clear focus on military applications and confront the threats to its national security posed by the Chinese government's military civil fusion strategy. Meanwhile, the Commerce Department also added 13 Chinese companies to its entity list, a list of firms considered to be involved in activities contrary to U.S. national security and foreign policy interests. Tuesday's release noted that foundries producing chips for listed firms will need a Bureau of Industry and Security license before the foundries may send such chips to these entities or parties acting on behalf of these entities. The latest announcement comes after the department issued a rule last week updating general authorizations for South Korean chipmakers, Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix to continue supplying their China-based plants with certain U.S. semiconductor manufacturing equipment. Lee seung Arirang News. Meanwhile, in the football field, Team Korea beat its Vietnamese counterpart by six goals to none in a friendly match this past Tuesday. Playing at the Suwon World Cup Stadium, five Korean players put their names down on the score sheet. The Tegak Warriors took the lead just five minutes into the match, with Kim min -jae scoring off his shoulder from Lee Gang ins corner. Hwang in chan made it 2-0 in the first half before Son Heung min Lee Gang in and Chung Woo Young found the net after the break. Vietnam gave up an own goal in the 50th minute. A prominent pundit on Korean Peninsula Affairs has praised South Korea's expanded role in ensuring broader stability and security, saying Seoul is now, quote, an equal partner of Washington. Our senior correspondent, Oh Soo-young, sat down with him. 
South Korea is now an equal partner of the United States, with the potential to join the Group of Seven Nations to cooperate on mounting global security threats and challenges. That's according to Victor Cha, a former U.S. National Security Council director on Asian affairs, speaking to Arirang News in Seoul. Amid reports of North Korea increasing weapons exchanges with Moscow, Cha voiced concern that Pyongyang's emboldened posture could make it harder to deter the regime's missile and nuclear ambitions. The North Koreans were able to do quite well at gaining all the parts it needed for their ICBM program despite very harsh sanctions. So, um, uh, so I worry about, if, if, especially if Russell, Rus Russia facilitates it, I worry that the North Koreans will be able to get, get away with a lot. He underscored the need for stronger deterrence measures by Seoul, Washington and Tokyo based on their trilateral Camp David agreements to ramp up three-way military measures to deter Pyongyang and mechanisms to jointly address common challenges across the Indo-Pacific region. Yeah, I mean, South Korea, I think, is an equal partner. Um, it used to be the case that the United States was sort of the senior ally and Japan and Korea were the junior partners. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think it all starts with U.S., Japan, Korea. If that relationship is strong, then I think the United States feels like it's on solid footing, uh, whether it's dealing, managing the rise of China, or whether it's seeking broader uh, uh, regional architectures in Asia. The U.S.-Japan-Korea relationship is core. It's core to that, based on common security interests, but common values, common norms, uh, these sorts of things. In this push for freedom, human rights, and a rules-based global order, President Yoon suk last year became the first Korean leader to attend the G7 meeting as a guest nation and was invited again to the Hiroshima summit in May. Cha believes the group of advanced democracies could become a G8 to include South Korea. Yeah, I think so. Um, right now, the UN Security Council is not really functional because of China and Russia, uh, which means the United States and others need to seek out a new venue. But I do think, you know, I do think we're at a critical point right now in terms of being able to pull together three allies to move forward to shape the environment in which China will rise um, and to uh, work on things like supply chain, countering disinformation, these sorts of things. With disinformation by state actors shaping biased views on global affairs, Cha also touched upon the role of media outlets in democracies to promote unbiased, accurate content. Groups like Arirang, Gyeonhap, others that are sort of news-based, not with a lot of editorializing, if they make themselves available to these countries that are targets of Chinese disinformation, they can dramatically change the, I don't want to say alignment, the color, if you will, of, of uh, the countries. They would have to, they would no longer have to listen to Chinese media and populate the media platforms with Chinese content. Having highlighted Ho's democratic coming of age and growing soft power in his book co-authored by Ramon Pacheco Pardo, Cha noted how Seoul is taking initiative on areas like global development, health, supply chains and nuclear energy. In its quest to become a global pivotal state, Cha said South Korea has a lot to offer beyond its interests to benefit the world. Oh Seung, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. In Ukraine, President Volodymyr Zelensky has said that the country has used U.S.-supplied long-range missiles for the first time amid its ongoing war with Russia. Speaking on Tuesday evening, Zelensky said that the Army Tactical Missile System, or ATACOMS missiles used, had been effective and proven themselves. He did not specify when the missiles were deployed, but there are reports that they were used to destroy nine helicopters at Russian bases in East Ukraine, and that dozens of Russian troops were killed or injured. The ATACOMS were delivered to Ukraine in secret, with their maximum range reduced from 300 to 160 kilometers amid U.S. concerns about raising tensions with Russia. The missiles sent to Ukraine also carry cluster munitions instead of a single explosive charge. In the Belgian capital of Brussels, the gunman who killed two Swedish citizens and injured another on Monday has been shot dead. 
Described by local media as a 45-year-old Tunisian man named Abdes Salim, the shooter was killed on Tuesday morning local time after being confronted by authorities in a cafe. Police say they found a weapon on him and a bag of clothes. They added that the attack may be linked to the Israel-Hamas conflict. The gunman's death comes hours after he fatally shot two Swedish citizens and later admitted to the killings in a video posted to social media. Monday's shooting came ahead of a football match between Belgium and Sweden. The Euro 2024 qualifying match was abandoned at halftime over security concerns. In a major setback to the rights of same-sex couples, India's Supreme Court on Tuesday refused to legalize same-sex marriages. The decision comes after the Supreme Court heard 21 arguments on the case between April and May this year. The top court instead said that the decision lies with India's parliament and that the court can only interpret the law and not make it. The justices instead voiced support for a government proposal to create a panel to review granting rights and benefits to same-sex couples. The court added that same-sex couples should be provided legal protections from the state and that denying them benefits and services given to heterosexual couples violates their fundamental rights. And finally, the Amazon River has fallen to its lowest level in over 120 years, amid a severe drought. As of Monday, levels at the Brazilian port of Manaus were recorded at 13.59 meters, compared to 17.6 meters one year ago. It's the lowest level since records began in 1902. Tributaries to the Amazon River have also dried up, leaving boats stranded and cutting off food and water supplies to remote villages. Meanwhile, high water temperatures are suspected of being behind the deaths of more than 100 endangered river dolphins. The drought follows months without rain and higher than normal temperatures that are being blamed on this year's El Nino climate phenomenon. Matthew Ashley, Alidang News. Good afternoon. Autumn colors arrived behind schedule on Pukansan Mountain yesterday, which came two days later than usual. We had another chilly night helping autumn colors to expand. Single digit morning temperatures to start out the day in Seoul, but highs are rising fast to the 20s this afternoon. And it's another day with big temperature swings. Gaps could be nearly 20 degrees Celsius in some parts of the country. So so please do dress accordingly for the weather conditions today. Seoul goes up to 21, Busan topping out at 24 degrees Celsius this afternoon under plenty of autumn sunshine during the day. Then central regions will see more clouds joining in as the day goes on. Then rain is in the forecast in the capital and west of Gangwon-do province tomorrow from dawn, spreading nationwide Thursday. And that rain could continue into Friday morning. And rain will bring a big chill to the country this weekend. So please plan accordingly and dress warmly for autumn activities you may want to enjoy this weekend. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. And that brings us to the end of Wednesday's edition of the Daily Report. Coming up next is our latest edition of Issues and Insiders. Do stay with us.